What kind of student are you? Specifically in regards to a student of Jesus, a student of the Bible, a student of the Word. What kind of student are you? You know, if you rated your overall habits as far as Bible study and those types of things where you're growing in knowledge, you think about grading yourself, thinking about some of your habits. What kind of student would you be? Now, our salvation is not dependent, of course, on how good we study or don't. We know that, right? But the very word disciple, the literal translation of the word disciple in Greek, does anyone know what it is? It's a learner. A learner. So what kind of student are you? You know, think about that. Because we all have strengths and weaknesses, right? If this was basketball camp, some may say, you know, how strong is your left hand? And you have to think about that. How strong is your foul shooting? Now they have stats and numbers they could look at and tell you, right? This is self-evaluation. Ask yourself, what kind of Bible student am I? How serious do I take the study element of the Christian life? So I want to start off by reading a passage, a Bible verse, and after that we will pray because that was the introduction. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. If you could please turn there. And we know who the good students are of the Bible because how quick they turn there. <laughs> if you have a real Bible, you know you can uh, get a little cheat. You guys see these little tabs on the side of the Bible? Does anybody, you guys know what those are? What's that called? But the, no, it's not. It's the technical name. What do you guys, it's called a, a what kind of a Bible? Starts with an I. Indexed. Yes, these are indexes. So if you want a Bible like this, look up index Bible or index. That's a little thing. And on the side, it'll say, ooh, 110. And then you put your thumb in there and you flip there. You don't have to look at the table of contents every time. Yeah, that's how it works. Okay. So we're going to go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy was written by Timothy, right? No? What? Who wrote Timothy? Who did he write it to? Right. Okay. You got. You guys see? I've heard people say, you know, when Timothy wrote his epistle, <laughs> Timothy didn't write Timothy. So Paul writes to Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor. He's a young pastor in a, in a church called Ephesus. And I want to show you what he says to Timothy, because this really ultimately applies to all of us. Guys, do we understand within Christianity the idea is not that a pastor or a teacher is up there. We watch them live out our faith, and then we go home and come back next week so they can do some more religious stuff for us. That's not it. This is all participatory, meaning the pastor, the teacher, they're not perfect. We know that, but they are supposed to model elements of the Christian life to us. So it's not that they're doing it for us. They're, by God's grace, trying to show us how it's done. And then guess what? You do that same thing in your life with others. As you model, the pastor's not the professional and he does the religious stuff that only he can do. That's not how it works. Now, don't get me wrong. There is such thing as a pastor and leaders and teachers, but we need to kind of understand Christianity is not a religion where here the, here's the professional Christians. Here's us regular Christians. doesn't work that way. There's only one Jesus, all right? There's only one, and your local pastor ain't him. Here's what 1 Timothy 4 says. Until I come, devote yourselves to the public reading of Scripture. When you hear the word devote, what do you think? Yeah, that's good. Dedicate. So if you're supposed to devote or dedicate yourself to the public reading of Scripture, does that mean you only read Scripture in public? Now, let's picture this. If he's a pastor, why would he be devoting himself to the public reading of Scripture? What's especially the context this may be relevant in? Where would Timothy maybe be doing this? Which may need in a house, church, basically, right? In, a, in some type of worship service, which probably is in somebody's house. Don't know if it's his. Usually it'd be the person who was the most generous, had a little bit of money compared to the rest of the church, so they had more room, meet there. And usually it was someone different than the pastor, but it just depends how it worked out. So here we are. 
He's supposed to do this. This teaches us a few things, doesn't it? Number one, what should be done at a worship service of Christians? Based upon this little line here. Yes. Well, no, just what, read what it says. Just read what it says. What should happen at a worship service of Christians based upon this verse, right? Just verse 13. There should be public reading of Scripture. Do you guys see? So that means at the service, there should be reading of Scripture. What, what, what I'm trying to say here is that means it's 1 Timothy 4.13. 1 Timothy 4.13. Sorry about that. Yeah. So that means you should be at a fellowship at a church where part of what happens is the Bible's being read. And the idea is not just being read, but of course being explained and studied and taught, right? If you go to a church service, and the pastor gets up, tells some jokes, tells some family stories, shows a video, rides around on a tricycle, and then at the very end says, kind of like Paul told Timothy, and that's the end. Did we really study the scripture? Is that really the public reading of scripture? Yeah, you know, it's like uh, three points in a poem type preaching. But there's a lot of preaching like that. So part of this series, if you're like, why are they doing how to be a healthy church member? They're trying to beat us over the head and just make us dedicated to report. No. If you move, you want to know how to be a healthy church member. But part of knowing how to be a healthy church member is being in a healthy church. So we also want to guide you in your discernment about how to select these places. Because for far too long, too many Christians have done it based upon the paint looks new and uh, they have their own app. And uh, the kids got two bags of candy here. They only got one at the last church. And uh, I really thought that joke was funny, didn't you? And uh, that one... Uh, person of the opposite sex in the front row, these are not really the reasons for you to select your place to plant yourself. So when you move, you want to also be at a place where the public reading of Scripture is part of what happens at that church. We're not here to judge anyone, but we just want you to set high standards for yourself in your Christian walk so you can elevate and grow and not be an 80-year-old baby Christian. Verse 13 continues and says, to exhortation, to teaching. So if the pastor is supposed to do this, this means this is supposed to happen in the service, and you're supposed to take note of it. It's supposed to be part of what happens there. So you want to be at a church where there's reading of Scripture, where you're being exhorted and taught what's in the Scripture. The pastor is breaking it down, explaining it in a way that makes sense, and hopefully doing it right, not... I didn't know what this meant, but then I had a dream, and I'll explain it to you now what it meant because I got a vision from the Lord. That's not proper Bible study. How could you imitate that kind of Bible study? Because you've got to learn how to do this on your own. You see what I'm saying? Not secret dreams that only the pastor has or something like that. The exhorting part is the idea of calling you to something, to challenge you. To, to correct, to put forth something, and to teaching. That is one of the most important functions of a pastor and of leadership ability is to be able to teach. But guess what? The idea is not just for this person to teach. It's for you to learn how to be able to teach others. You're not just supposed to be a spiritual sponge and you just soak it up. Nothing wrong with learning. That's the point. But the idea is then to be able to do the same thing to others. Sierra's not here and her mother's not here, but you know what they do? Lots of Sundays they go back. What are they, does anyone know what they do? What do they do back every Sunday? Right. They go back there and who do they teach? Are you one of them? So you know to talk? Oh, no. You haven't been back there? What is it? No good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> she wants to hang out with us. That's why. Well, I guarantee you, every Sunday, Angie, Sierra, whoever else is back there, Rob's been back there, they prepare their lesson before, have some idea of what it's going to say, including the Bible, and then they walk the kids through it. 
You may say, well, that's just kids. It takes a lot of skill to be able to explain difficult concepts to children. That helps you show you really know it. What's my point by saying that? You, as you teach others, you may not know all the answers. There's no such thing, but you can know enough to teach others, can't you? You know, really, in a certain sense, to teach, you only got to be basically one step ahead of um, you know, it's ideal if you know more, but really you only got to be on the next page. Do you, you, you see what I'm saying? So start with what you know. Do that. Do not neglect the gift you have, verse 14 says, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So this is leadership that's been confirmed by other Christians. This is a point by that. Every Christian in authority should be a Christian under authority in some meaningful way. We don't have popes here. Practice these things. This is a regular walk. He's constantly supposed to do this. Immerse yourself in them. So look, if you think even going to a healthy church once a week is enough for you to become a solid student of the word, think again. It says immerse yourselves in them. Immerse. When you think of immerse, what do you think of? That's good. Kind of like almost even in baptism immerse no that's no that's good i'm saying that's the same thing plunge in exactly soak yourself with these things immerse yourself in them because there's you can go to a great bible teaching church right but if that is not imitated in your own lifestyle it's a limited benefit sure it's better than going to joel Osteen's church or something just saying but you don't become a stronger Christian by osmosis, do you? You can't lay the Bible under your pillow and then put your head down and wake up and be like, 1 John 5, 3 says, doesn't work that way. Practice these things. Huh? You can, we're going to talk about that. But that's not osmosis. But we're going to talk about that, how to immerse yourself in these things. We're going to talk about how to how to do these things with podcasts and, and all kinds of things. We're going to talk about that. You're right. So that all may see your progress. Every Christian should be a growing Christian. You guys, you know, I don't really like water and swimming, but we know the basics of some things about water, I think. What's the difference between a swamp and a river? What is the difference? Okay, one is running. Keep on going with that. Say what? Yes, but why is it? Why? There's, you're getting closer, basically. There's no outlet. There ain't going nowhere. Do you guys see, right? When I was a little boy, I had family in Miami, went down to the Everglades and took one of those weird little boat, fan boat things and saw all kinds of swamps. So, yeah, it's a different type of world down there. So, it has no outlet. That's why it's what it is. Whereas a river is a, a tributary to something else. It's feeding into something else. There's a difference, and that's, that's where the running element comes in. Not running or flowing. You can see the difference in the life. We need to be where we are going into something, not just poured into. Verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. So this is something we're diligent about. Persist in this. Do you notice how serious this is? For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Ultimately, it's good for you to become wise in the Bible and study the Scriptures, but ultimately the reason it's so you can benefit others. That's what this walk is about. Not just for the sake of reasons to keep studying. One, for the sake of your life. This is, there is an internal self element to this, which is kind of like the same reason why you eat. You know, you may not remember what you ate two, three days ago for breakfast, if you had breakfast. But you, it's okay, well, someone knows. But you know that you've been eating recently, or else you'd be really hungry or go too long, you'd be dead. So it's important that you are constantly doing this thing. It's a regular part of what you need, right? 
It is similar with being fed on the word and fed the word. This is something that you may not remember what you studied last week. Now, you may specifically, but it's a regular habit just like eating where it's again and again and again. And do this over enough time, you'll find out, wow, look at how I've grown, what I've seen, what I've learned. Has anyone done the Zoom Monday night? Go through the... How has it been for you? Right? Do you feel like over the past time you've been involved, you feel like you've grown with Bible knowledge, or is it just no? Has it helped you keep on track with regular reading? The fellowship part? Okay. Okay. What about you? You said, how is it? So you feel like it's timely, like, you're learning it here, and then it immediately becomes applicable in some way. Praise God. That's a beautiful testimony. Thank you. So you see there, the next thing, what you're saying, well, this relates to all of them, but you keep studying for the sake of your life, but you also keep studying for your ministry. Does anyone know what the word minister basically means? Any guesses? What do you think minister means? Or to be in ministry? Because you see those. See, that's what's interesting. So usually because we think of the minister, right? But minister means to serve. That's what the word means. Yeah, the, I think it's along the lines of the servant. Yeah, minister. Yeah, the servant. Yeah. So that's minister. The word means to serve. So if you're in ministry, you're literally saying you're in service. So when we say minister so-and-so, it's actually not really a high and mighty title. It just means servant. That's what that's what the word means when you when you look when look at the Greek word of it. That's what it means. So, minister is just servant to serve. So, should every Christian be in ministry? Should every Christian be a minister in that sense? Yes, every single one of us, every single one of us, in some way, has a different ministry, and so. You can't really give out unless you've got something to give. That's why you got to become a student of the word. That's why, you know, you ask someone a question when you're younger about the Bible. And they have no idea. They say, well, just ask God when you get to heaven. That'll help nobody. Don't be that guy. Don't be that gal. How do you avoid that? By studying. You got to know. Sharing the gospel. Well, I'll go to teaching others next. Keep studying for teaching others. Every one of us may not be a teacher like this, but that's just one part of teaching. Every Christian should be working on the gift of teaching. Yes, there's different levels, but every single one of us. If you can't, think about what it is to be a parent. You got to teach those kids the word. And that's just one element. Let's say you have a friend who becomes a Christian. And they're the one you trust, and you're in their life. What do you got to do? You got to teach that person. You can't just say, click on this link. I mean, I'm not saying anything's wrong with saying, click on the link to watch Pastor So-and-So. But I'm saying, there's got to be more to it than that. Because guess what? In the first century, they couldn't say, click on this link, Titus. Could they, right? Don't get lazy, Americans. Also for sharing the gospel. It is so fundamental for us to understand the basic good news about what all this is. Otherwise, you can't share it. And that's why it's good for you to put yourself in uncomfortable situations where you're almost forced to have to share the gospel with people because it helps you grow as well. And the Lord can use you in your weakness. If you don't want to do it, part of the reason is there's a couple reasons maybe. One is you think it's all dependent upon you. But it's not it's dependent upon the spirit. So if you think it's just on you, you're real nervous because we'll all mess up. But it's not dependent upon you. Number two, maybe because you feel guilty because you haven't been doing your due diligence, so you don't know what you're talking about. Neither of those are good reasons. Rob, you've done street evangelism. You've run into some wild characters out there, haven't you? What's it? What? <laughs> what have you learned by putting yourself in those tough spots? Do you feel like you're always ready, though? 
but you know what? The way you get there is you got to, you, you don't just shadow box your whole life. All this relates and points to when I talk about how to be a better church member to the word of God. And Francis Schaefer, he's a Christian intellectual from the 70s. So he's old school. He's no longer alive, but he was a great man when he was here. And he had a little thing he would say. He wrote a book with this title. He is there and he is not silent. Just the title alone is good for you to remember and know. He is there and he is not silent. And it's a, it's a great book and it's a biblical concept. Let me explain what it is. Number one is God exists. God is. Number one. I mean, my goodness, we could spend forever just talking about that. You know, people used to think as we learn more in science, God will make less and less sense because we'll explain everything. Then we're able to see down into DNA now, and we say, oh, this is a language. DNA is a language. Not only that, it can fix itself. It's self-replicating. And all the instructions have to already be ready for any part of it to work, so you can't build it in steps. It's like a mousetrap. Every single part has to work or it doesn't function. Or we can look out, not just the microscope, we can look out with a telescope, way out there and say, oh, and realize what a privileged planet we live on. God is there is my point by just saying those things real quick. And he is not silent. What if God made everything and was like, that looks good. Walks off like Jay-Z when he retired the first time. That's that. But I mean, he came back. I'm just saying. Meaning God created it all and it was like, peace out, world. I did my job. I'm good. You guys hang in there. You, you got this. God is not silent, meaning he's a communicating God. So since he's there and he's not silent, we don't get to make up stuff about him. Well, I think God would be like this. Well, my kind of God would do this. Why would you, you? Do you realize that's idolatry? Because what you're doing is crafting a God in your own idea, in your own image. You don't have to make a statue of a bull and fall down. You can have a mental picture that you've crafted because it's a God in your image instead of God for who he really is. So God is there and he speaks. We don't get to tell him who he is. He tells us who he is. How does he speak? He speaks in the word. You know, when the pastor's like, you better come back tonight because I've got a word for you. God told me something last night, but I'm saving it till seven o'clock. And if you don't come and drop that seed offering, you won't be blessed by this special anointing. You only get it right here. Won't be recorded. You got to come here and pay. the. Do you know that every morning you can wake up after you read the Bible, close it and say, God just spoke to me. Did you know that? Now. I'm not saying you tell everybody that every day that way. You tell them what the Bible says, but, you know, you might end up in a straitjacket every day. You say, God just spoke to me. But every day God speaks to you if you read the word. What else is happening? We're going to switch gears a little bit here and focus on a concept that has to do with learning and studying, which is disciple. Disciple. This word disciple, when you look in the Old Testament, the first part, of the Bible, the actual word disciples not hardly really there, only a few times. And it's very interesting that when you look at people in the Old Testament, they don't ever create these great followings around themselves. Like if you study the Greek, the Greek philosophers, they would have schools they would establish, the different philosophers. And some would charge, some wouldn't. But they would have these disciples who would follow them around and gain from their wisdom. And then after the teacher died, they would pass on their wisdom in these Greek philosophical schools. The Israelites didn't really have that. They were supposed to be a community of learners. They were communal learners. And the reason is, is because it's not the wisdom of one person. It's the wisdom of God's revelation that he's given. So in a very real sense, Israel, Old Testament Israel, are disciples of Yahweh. He is their one that ultimately is teaching them. Now, how does he do it? He does have spokespeople in the Old Testament, prophets. Prophet doesn't mean to predict. The word actually comes from a word that means to speak for. So you're speaking on behalf of somebody else. So think of prophets as God's spokespeople. That's what, that's what they are in the Old Testament, ultimately. They're not fortune tellers. 
Very rarely actually do they tell the future. They're God's spokespeople. Now, when they speak, the idea, though, is they're studying what Yahweh said. So when Moses passes on, they don't worship Moses. They look at what God relayed to Moses for Israel. So they're learning Torah together. What is Torah? Anybody know? It is Scripture, but what parts of Scripture? First, go lower. Go lower. Go lower. Lower. Oh, there we go. Five. All right. I know you said it, but I'm having some fun with them. Gee. Okay, yeah. The first five books. Genesis, Leviticus, yes. Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those five, right? The Torah. So when you say Torah, you're technically just talking about those. Now, what happens is when you talk to a Jewish person, they'll use Torah as a synonym for the whole law as well. But it comes out of the first five books of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Yeah, what's up? Go, it's all right. You don't got to apologize. Well, after Moses dies, there are people who come after him that point back to the Torah and bring additional revelation. So God is progressing in his revelation. He's telling Israel more and more about himself over time. So, for example, there was no promise made to David, really, in the Torah because there was no David. That would come in the book of 2 Samuel. So later on in Joshua, Moses essentially handed the reins over to Joshua. He was like the official successor. So they did know that and understood there would be succession. But it's interesting. If you look, the first five books of Moses are law. But Joshua is where the books in the Bible start that are labeled as the history, historical, kind of like genres of music. These first five tracks are a B. The sixth song is country. So it's a different genre. It's still literature, but it goes from law to historical. Now it's saying what the Israelites did. It's not as much if this happens, do this. So Joshua follows after the five. It's number six. But uh, by the way, you know, that's where Jesus' name is from, Joshua. It's just the shortened version. Yeah, Joshua is a different way to, because Joshua is the English translation of the Hebrew, Yehoshua, and Jesus is the English translation of the Greek, Yeshua. So Jesus is named after Joshua because he's a deliverer. That's why, and he brings the people into the promised land. So here we are in Deuteronomy, and I want to show you verse 1. Follow along in your scripture, please. So now, O Israel... Listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to do so that you may live. Notice, Moses is not pointing Israel to himself. He's pointing them to God's word. That's what a pastor should do right as well. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it. By the way, you can also do that with incorrect interpretation, basically, because you're changing the meaning. That you may keep the commandments of Yahweh your God, which I am commanding you. Verse 5. Skip it a couple verses for the sake of time. See, I have taught you statutes and commandments just as Yahweh my God commanded you. So here's the part I want to show you where you see they're under God's teaching. You shall keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Only keep yourself and keep your soul very carefully, lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. But make them known to your sons and to your grandsons. Now the point by saying all that is, you see, that Israel as a community are learners of what God says. That's why they value their teachers so high for that reason. But the whole people is a community of learners, of students, of disciples. And now in the New Testament era, we should be doing the same thing. Go to 17. I just want to show you something real quick. This is powerful to me. Israel did not have a king yet in the book of Deuteronomy. They were what's called a theocracy. Anybody know what a theocracy is? You got that word T-H-E-O? What's that? You got something? A kingdom's run by a god. The reason why I say that is because there's people that have other types of religious theocracies. And in the case of the Hebrew Bible, that means the, is, the old Israel is ran by God's law. There is no king yet. So that's what a theocracy is. Instead of a democracy, which is ruled by the people, 
theocracy is ruled by God. That's what it is. But later on, Israel became a monarchy. What's a monarchy? I got my crown on. See, this is my crown, right? That's a symbol. Yes, ruled by a king. Who's the first one? Saul. Remember? Remember Saul? King Saul? They went to David. They went to David's son, Solomon. And after that, they split apart and started fighting each other all the time. Here's my point. But there's a command in the Old Testament, years before they had a king, that when they got a king, here's what the king needs to do. Because in the ancient society, the king was way above everybody else. But he was supposed to be representative of the people. But a wicked king used the people for his own gain. But look at how Israel's king is supposed to function. Verse 17 says this. He shall not multiply wives for himself. Uh-oh, Israelite kings are supposed to be polygamous. Or else his heart will turn away. Exactly what happened to Solomon. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. Nor it will be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom. I'm sorry, now it will be. So this is what he's supposed to do. Listen to this. He shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. This is saying the king is supposed to sit down and write his own copy of the Torah, basically. Perhaps you could just say maybe the book of Deuteronomy. But the king is supposed to... Now, why would the king be commanded to do that? Why would the king have to copy part of the Bible? The king himself sit there and copy the whole book. Why would he have to do that? That way he knows what it says. Do you guys see that? That's exactly why. This is part of the king's learning and instruction. And the very next verse says that, just what you said, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment. The king himself is under the law. Nobody is above the law. Now, there's individual examples. We're going to have to actually skip these. But the next slide is in the book of Psalms. This shows this individual devotion because I mentioned it's communal but also you see heartfelt passion where individual Israelites are meditating upon God's word day to night. The next slide, Psalm 119 says the same thing. We're going to have to skip this for sake of time tonight here. Uh, and now I want to point to something in the Old Testament that's predicted. It's the new covenant promise. The Old Testament has the old covenant, but the New Testament has the new covenant. What's a covenant? It's a biblical word, but what's a covenant? But, well, well you, I like I like that. We'll work with that. People come together and agree to something. That's basically that's right. So it, it's an agreement. It is a contract, but it's more than a contract because it has a a warm relationship element to it. Say what? No, your first one is better. <laughs> but you got it. What, what you guys have said: a contract. People come together and agree. So when we talk about biblical covenants, we're talking about covenants between God and His people. So what is the new covenant? It's predicted in the old covenant. If someone tries to tell you this Christianity thing is not even the Old Testament, it's not even there, you go and you can show them places where it is, such as Jeremiah chapter 31. So prophet Jeremiah, centuries before Jesus, says this in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah not like the covenant which I cut with their fathers. This is something new. Verse 33, this is the covenant which I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me. What's going on here? Jeremiah is prophesying a day will come where the arrangement between God and his people will be different. And indeed, it will be better. Now, what happens in the new covenant? It is inaugurated by Jesus. The word inaugurated means started, but it's not brought to fruition or completion until Jesus returns. So we are in the new covenant right now. How do you know that? Well, for example, when Jesus was at the Last Supper, he said, 
this cup is the blood of the new covenant poured out for many. So he's telling you his death brings in the new covenant. That's why if you really want to, you are allowed to eat a BLT. That's why you can wear fringes or not wear fringes. That's why you can worship and gather on Sunday or Saturday or Friday. That's why, I don't think we have to cover our ears here. If you have a kid, you can circumcise them, but you're not required to. And if they become a Christian and they're uncircumcised later, they don't have to go under the knife. They want to, they can. But in the Old Testament, none of those were negotiable. No pork, pork yes, knife, no, I'm sorry, pork no, knife yes. See what I'm saying? The knife being shorthand for circumcision, people. Now we're under a new covenant. New covenant, new rules. Does that mean God ever throws everything away? No, you get to murder people. No, the unchangeable moral law doesn't change. Murder was always wrong, but the incidentals and in how we keep the arrangement, they are different. That's why on Yom Kippur, you'll find me chilling in church right here, not watching the priests kill a lamb. Guess what? You can't even really watch the priest kill a lamb because God's taken away the temple, so it's not even an option, but that's okay because Jesus said one greater than the temple is here. Are we following? The new covenant is better. Now, it's prophesied there. It's also prophesied in Isaiah 54. We're going to have to skip that for now. But the important part of why I'm bringing that up is in it, God says, you won't need to be taught. You'll know. Now, that is completed at the end when we're in heaven and glorified bodies. But in between time, what it means is every one of us have a priestly ministry, not just the priests. Every one of us has a teaching ministry in a sense, not just the prophets. There's a level playing field that wasn't there before because each Christian is empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the real reason why. That's the difference. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people for a task, but was not permanently dwelling in them. In the New Testament, the Bible describes a Christian as being permanently dwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's part of God's relationship with you, is the Holy Spirit's power in your life on a regular basis. So here's where we want to wind down, is right here. What is a disciple of Christ? The concept of a disciple does pop up heavily in the New Testament. They're constantly referred to. They are learners of Jesus. My point by saying this to you is this is what we should be now in 2024, is disciples of Christ. And he is the word of God himself. So we're no longer in a situation where we are just looking only to the book. We are looking at the embodiment or personification of the book. Now, we still look to the book, but my point is, Jesus is everything that is in the book was ever supposed to be. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus did that by dying on the cross. Every command there could be, he perfectly exemplified and did. So we are his disciples now. So now we're in the new covenant situation. I want you to turn for probably our last scripture for today. It's Titus. It's a small little letter. It's towards the back of your Bibles. It was not written by Titus. It's written by Paul to Titus. And we're going to look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And here's where we wind down. Here's the idea. We've seen that God has always been speaking and communicating and teaching with his people. We see the way in which he's done that has changed in a manner of speaking and that now Jesus has come, who is described as the Word, and now in the life of the church, God's people living out a new covenant reality are disciples of Christ in a way that we're never supposed to be disciples of Moses, but we are disciples of Christ because everything in the Scripture points to him. So when you follow a Christ, you're following everything God ever said. That's why it's kind of trite, but the bracelet, what would Jesus do? It's got some truth to it. 
We should ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? But we don't have to guess. We read the Bible and then apply it. That's the thing. It's not just like, all right, now we're in Titus 2. So this is for what we are to do as we are disciples of Christ in the church. That means this is what you're supposed to do, starting in verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? This is a command given by Paul to Titus. So if a pastor is supposed to teach sound doctrine, that means you're supposed to learn sound doctrine. What is sound doctrine? Yes. Yes. Solid what, though? Solid doctrine. What's, what's doctrine? Yeah, what everyone's saying, let's put it all together. Doctrine is the set of beliefs. This is speaking in, as far as Christianity goes. Set of beliefs that line up with the Bible. So your doctrine or your beliefs that are supposed to be in line with Scripture. So if someone says, turn to this book right here. This book teaches us that God only likes one race and hates the other races. Thank you very much. That, that's not sound doctrine, right? So sound doctrine means it's the beliefs that are in line with Scripture. Now let's look at how this plays out in the daily life of the church. Verse 2, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. So this is a description of what the older men in the church are supposed to exemplify. Not just the pastors. And why does he emphasize the older men need to do that? What, what do you think the reason is for that? Right. So what should the older men help do? So the older men are to help to train the younger men, but they have to be good models and examples first to do it. Now, sometimes you get old fools, people that have been in church for 30 years and haven't grown at all. They're not following this instruction. and Don't be like those guys when you get to be that old. But I guess it's better they're here than at the bingo hall or wherever old men go these days. Older men. Now look at the very next verse. Older women. Don't see any of those in here tonight, but hopefully they'll watch this online. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Just so you know, that verse is not popular in 2024. Older women teach the young women to love their husbands and children. How about love yourself? Women power. What? <laughs> not just saying. The scripture was always countercultural, though. Verse 5, this is for the young women now. So train the young women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled, to be pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands. That's important because it doesn't say submissive to every man that ever walked the earth, to their own husbands. That the word of God may not be reviled. It's an example for the world to see this. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled, Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. The idea is have what you teach match how you live. And that goes for everybody. None of us can nail that 100%. And thank God our salvation is not based upon it. But our goal, our aim, our heart's desire must be that what we say matches with how we live. In a sense, we're all hypocrites who don't achieve that. Don't act like it's not true. We know that. But that's we're not okay with that. That's not where we're staying. That's not what we want. That's not where we want to be, right? We know that. And so we help each other grow. That's why when you fall, you fall, I fall, she falls. We back each other up. We help each other out. Because guess who's going to fall next? The person that helped them out last time. That's how it is. So putting all this together, I encourage us to keep studying. And I'm going to give a couple practical tips. And then 
Here's some ways in 2024. I don't know how well you could see that, that you can continue to grow through. I'm going to list a couple. Make these part of your life. Podcasts and sermons. Now, this has to do with what you listen to. What do you spend your time listening to? Think about it. It's important to consider. Your appetite as you become a more serious Christian should change what your ears want to hear. And part of what your ears want to hear because your soul needs it are good podcasts and good sermons. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with entertainment, but Lord knows we get entertained plenty. Start to develop a passion for good, solid teaching. Not to replace what happens here, but to supplement what happens here. Podcast sermons. Next, sermons and talks. Oh, I have sermons on there twice. That's all right. These are things you can get all on your phone, all on your computer, and pretty much are all free. So there's no excuse. If you don't know where to start, we can talk about that. Eric knows. I know. Rob knows. Let's talk about what would work for where you're at. Dialogues and, yes, even debates. But I would also say have dialogues. Yes, listen to, but have them. One of the ways you will learn a lot is by talking to people. Yes, more mature Christians, younger Christians, but also people you disagree with. Continue to grow through books and reading. If you think you can't do it, you've got so many options. Basically, Christians should be readers. I know a lot of people who had no interest in reading. They got saved. All of a sudden, they had an interest in reading. It's not incidental that God left us a book. He didn't leave us a podcast. He left us a book. So Christians got to be readers by the very nature of our faith. But I'm not a good reader. God knows that. But that doesn't mean you're not supposed to read. Reading's got to be part of your life. Now, how does this work? You have so many options. You can listen to CDs. People still do that sometimes. You can put books on your phone and it can read to you. Audio books. You can go to Audible, but there's also a place called ChristianBook.com. There's all ChristianAudio.com. There's all these places where, and you should sometimes read books that are above what you understand to challenge you. Do you know if you have a book downloaded on Kindle and then you have the Alexa app, you can have your Alexa read you your Kindle books even if you don't have the audio book? Now, it uses the AI voice, but every time I'm in the shower, Ki uh, Alexa, read my Kindle book. I just finished a book on typology that way. One day I'll explain what typology is. But this is what you can do. This is not to say, oh, look, we're great. The idea is you develop these habits. But I don't, I've never done that. How do that's why this sermon is here? But I'm 50. I've done I'm okay. I haven't done it this long. Well, why <laughs> it's part of what growth is, people. Books and reading are part of the Christian life. No one is saying that you're not going to heaven if you don't read a book, but Christians shouldn't be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you write that down in your notes. <laughs> Lastly, every now and then you should do some in-depth research. Some of us blame other people for we don't have answers about stuff. Okay, pastors should have answers, true. But some of you, instead of just saying, well, they didn't answer my question, why don't you study that question? Why do we go to church on Sunday? Why do we believe in the Trinity? Why do we think Jesus is the Messiah? Ask people, but they're not, they don't live with you. They're not in your head. At the end of the day, you got to know. So you are allowed to take time and study something that you may never get paid for, that you may or may not speak on in public, but that it's important for you to know for your own growth. In-depth research. But I didn't go to college with the Internet. Now, it gets tricky. There are so many options. Now, that's why it's good to have people help guide you, say, where's a good place to start? I have some more slides about some practical resources. I just don't have time to do it, but let me give you some, a couple of tips. I mentioned listening to audio books in the shower. There's so many places. If you're at the gym, when you go running, when you go walking, these books can be reading to you. Yes, you can sit down and read books. I do that. If I'm sitting down, sometimes I'm like, oh, I want to watch a, I want to watch a dumb show. Then I almost, almost always, sometimes I, you know, I'm almost always saying, no, I'm not going to watch a dumb show. I'm going to read this. 
And so then it and it always benefits me. The point again is not to say, look what we do. The point is to say, look what you can do and what you should do. That's the point here. There's more I want to say about this, but I want us to kind of wrap it all up with this that every Christian should be a person who wants to develop a passion for studying and understands that part of being a disciple is being a student. And a student is one who's constantly learning. And that means every single one of us. And imagine if our church is filled with people like that who are studying constantly, teaching others constantly. Imagine on a Wednesday how many different people over time, I'm not talking about tomorrow, could be up here helping to lead a Bible study over time as they develop these gifts. And it's not just this, it's or helping with the kids or explaining things at a Bless the Block event. The list is endless because the needs are great, aren't they? So I hope today that you're challenged and encouraged. There's more I wanted to get to. I'm sorry I could not. But I hope that we leave and say, Lord, help me be a better student of you than I am now.